Today's date is 10 October 2023. My name is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience, and I'm here in Williamsburg, Virginia. Got the pleasure to sit down and speak with Al Crane. Thank you, Al, for sitting down and talking to us. Thank you, Dennis, and I appreciate the work the uh, American Wartime Experience is, uh, is doing to uh, um, keep our history alive and, and for generations to come. Well, thank you for that. Uh, if you could just give us some background on who you are. Where were you born, grow up, go to school, that kind of thing? I was born in uh, 1943 in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, shortly after, my dad uh, uh, went in the service and uh, served overseas at the U.S. Army, the 774th Field Artillery Battalion. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, he was a British subject, uh, uh, was naturalized when he uh, uh, joined the Army. Uh, his family immigrated uh, after the Great War. My grandfather, Albert Crane, was uh, a royal engineer was gassed during the war, but did survive. After the war, we uh, grew up uh, a little bit north north of Philly, Upper Darby, and then we moved to uh, North Jersey. Uh, my dad got a job with Ford Motor Company, the uh, International Sales Division in Weehawken, and we lived initially in Bergenfield and then Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, I graduated from Teaneck High School in 1961. I had a very early interest in science and space travel and uh, you'd we'd, we'd go to the library and read everything I could on, on uh, aviation, uh, mm -hmm. especially interested in the uh, technology and so on and so forth. At the, age, at the age of 14, I joined the Civil Air Patrol as a cadet, Teterboro Squadron. Uh, started working in the motor pool on maintaining uh, trucks and Jeeps and DKWs and uh, ambulances, so on and so forth. Uh, also had a chance to fly in a number of various aircraft, the Cessna uh, 190, the uh, Ronca Air Coop, which was the, that was our uh, Civil Air Patrol uh, air rescue plane. Uh, watching TV back then, uh, the Disney uh, program had uh, their uh, space uh, specials with Werner von Braun and mm -hmm. talking about the uh, voyages. They also had specials on the Wright brothers and. Uh, I even built a little wind tunnel in the garage to, to study aeronautics and, wow. and through several air patrol had a number of courses, of course, in aeronautics and navigation, so on and so forth. I was interested in furthering my studies and uh, I, was, I was also interested uh, in a career in the military, specifically the Air Force. Um, I looked around at the military academies and uh, various schools, but one of the other cadets in our Civil Air Patrol squadron uh, had become a cadet of the Citadel Military College of South Carolina. So in 1961, I was accepted and entered the College of uh, the, the Citadel uh, in 1961. Uh, General Mark Clark from World War II was the uh, president of the college, and uh, I embarked on uh, studies uh, leading to a degree in physics. Uh, during my tenure at the Citadel, uh, of course, we experienced the uh, Cuban crisis. The Citadel was right in the, right in the path of uh, uh, the airways going into Charleston Air Force Base. So as opposed to transport aircraft that day, we noticed uh, uh, a large number of or even leading up various aircraft. Uh, of course, my Civil Air Patrol days, an air spotter, I was noting all the different fighters and mm -hmm. bombers that were going in there. And then that evening, General Clark uh, convened the evening mess early, which was very unusual. And he addressed the, the Cadet Corps, and then President Kennedy got on and talked about what was going on. And uh, that brought the Cold War really home, that we were right in ground zero there in Charleston. Uh, also doing my studies at the Citadel uh, with the Society of American Mar Military Engineers, we had um, field trips to uh, Cape Canaveral twice and saw the construction of the uh, vertical assembly building and the blockhouses, so on and so forth. And also got out to uh, uh, Alabama to the uh, Army labs there and witnessed some of the firings of the rockets. And I was very interested in getting in the space program, as I mentioned. Upon uh, graduation, I got my orders to the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Laboratory at Edwards Air Force Base, California, as a research physicist. I was given the job of working on the uh, Titan II upgrades and new propellants for that. Uh, of course, it was a very exciting time for the Air Force. At Edwards, the B-70 was flying, the X-15, uh, the XC-142, uh, vertical liftoff and landing, 
uh, the X-24 lifting body that was a precursor to the space shuttle. Uh, a couple planes that didn't exist, quote unquote, were being tested at North Base, the uh, SR-71 Blackbird and the U-2. Although they did bring them out for uh, the uh, Armed Forces Day mm -hmm. in 1966, they had a roll-by and a fly-by. Uh, was uh, very, uh, the Air Force had the, the north end of the, uh, of the rocket lab on Rocket Ridge there, and NASA had the south side, and uh, they would be testing the uh, Apollo rocket and other rockets there. Unfortunately, during that time, two of my classmates uh, were killed in Vietnam, uh, uh, Joe Massar and Frank Murphy. And uh, an opportunity came up to volunteer for Vietnam uh, to serve uh, with uh, people uh, involved with the processing and the design and performance of cameras and rec the reconnaissance efforts. So I volunteered, uh, went, went to technical school at Lowry Air Force Base on precision photo processing and learned about the various Air Force cameras. Of course, that fit right in with my training at the Citadel and physics, chemistry, optics, so on and so forth. So at about 0230, we uh, were about to board a plane from Travis Air Force Base to fly us Saigon. Of course, the plane was delayed until the morning, and everybody knows that drill. And then there was a normal group of guys who didn't get their shots because they thought they could get away with not going to Vietnam and not getting their shots, but the uh, corpsmen were right there and pumped them with about eight shots, <laughs> boom, 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 right away. So we took off from Travis, uh, stopped, overstopped in, in uh, Hickam, uh, went from there to uh, Okinawa and then flew into Saigon. As we approached Saigon, the, this was on a stretch DC-8 uh, Flying Tigers airline as I remember, uh, he blacked out the lights and says, uh, gentlemen, we're going to make a steep descent and boy was he not kidding. We basically went down because he said it was a uh, there was active fire in the area, as there always was around Saigon. There was occasionally pot shots, occasional motor attacks, and so on and so forth. And we landed uh, again at O Dark 30. Was welcomed in, went to Camp Alpha for in processing, uh, and then was uh, spent the night in uh, Open Bay Barracks. And then uh, in the morning, my sponsor from my unit, uh, which was the 13th Reconnaissance Technical Squadron. Uh, picked me up and took, to, to, took me to my living quarters. It was a villa downtown. Now, why were we living downtown? Because this was the initial buildup in 1966, and they didn't have a lot of quarters on base. So, uh, with the exception of some of the generals and uh, uh, some of the other, like security police and so on and so forth, everybody pretty much uh, lived downtown. And I was in a villa in 23640 Truman Key Street. Uh, it was noisy all the time. Uh, at night, uh, you could hear the helicopters and occasional rifle fire. Um, in the morning, you wake up with chickens and motorcycles and the sound of a big city. At that time, there was no standard transportation to the base, so we had to get to the Tonsonut from downtown, about three, four miles, whatever way you could. There were scheduled buses, but in between, sometimes GIs with Jeeps or even dump trucks would take us to the base. Uh, what did our unit do? Our unit processed the film and read out the film and uh, wrote the intelligence reports, the initial photographic interpretation reports, or rippers as we call them, uh, from the film that was retrieved from the RF-4Cs, Phantom 2s, and the RF-101 uh, Voodoos that were stationed at Tan Sanu. Um, the uh, RF-101 Voodoo was primarily a day reconnaissance aircraft. It did have some cartridges for night photography, but that was soon uh, uh, terminated because as you flew along and popped the t cartridges, the enemy could see where you were and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. The RF-4C was uh, being equipped with uh, new technologies at the time. Infrared uh, scanning systems, the AAS-18, and the uh, um, ANAPQ-102, which was a side-looking airborne radar, which gave us a night capability. Um, also, uh, to try to determine where the camouflaged uh, uh, equipment was uh, and positions, 
there was also the introduction of uh, color, color infrared film, and uh, black and white infrared film. So from a technology standpoint, it was very exciting, and me as with a technical background and seeing how these could be used. I was not an interpreter per se, but I looked at the film from a technical standpoint, how the film was being, uh, how the cameras were performing and stuff like that, um, to, to give feedback to, to the photo lab. Of course, when the film came in, the air crews that had flown their missions, both in country and out country, would come in with the photo interpreters and read out the film, and, and the uh, photo technicians from the flight line would also, uh, uh, if there were any anomalies, would, it would be fed right back to them to see if the film was skipping or if they had shutter problems or if there was uh, electrical problems. Uh, we weren't the only photographic capability uh, in Vietnam. Uh, there was also the, Mo the Army had OV-1D Mohawks that were primarily up north. Uh, the Navy was flying uh, RF-4B aircraft and the RA-5C Vigilante from the carriers. Uh, and uh, we, later in my tour, uh, the AQM-134 Bumblebugs, or the fifth Ryan Firebees that were, with, that were equipped with cameras came on board. They were carried by C-130s, would launch and then come back and re be retrieved at uh, Ben Juan and flown down to us for processing. Um, also, the uh, initial flights of the uh, A-12 that was a CIA version of the Blackbird, mm -hmm. Uh, were being flown. The film was flown to the 67th Reconnaissance Technical Squadron at, uh, Yoko at Yokota, Japan, for processing and readout. And uh, in the spring of 67, we started getting uh, copies of that film called Black Shield. Uh, my duties there were photographic officer. Also, uh, I was uh, selected by the commander to be the security and distribution officer. That meant not only being responsible for all the classified material that came in and out, uh, but also getting the materials that we process, the film, the select prints, the reports out uh, by courier or whatever. Um, so part of my duties was uh, helping to set up the in-country courier system. Uh, at the time, obviously, we didn't have the analog electronics like we do today, mm -hmm. punch a button and a picture goes a thousand miles. Yeah. We process the film, make the prints, uh, make copies of the intelligence reports, and then they would have to be flown physically from Tansanut, where we were outside of Saigon, to the outlying units. Uh, I was honored to be part of teams that went out and briefed the Army and the Allied units on what type of missions we could fly for them, uh, how, how they could order them, uh, and to give them first-hand look at the products. Uh, we would take off in the flight line at Tansanut in the, uh, for the local missions in an S-3 uh, helicopter that was the baby brother of the uh, uh, Jolly Green Giant. And uh, we flew out to Nui Dot, which was the first Australian task force headquarters. Uh, of course, years later, uh, as depicted in the, in, in, in the movie Danger Close, uh, there was a very, some very significant battles uh, around Nui Dot uh, that the Aussies were involved with. We landed there, were greeted by the Aussies. Um, first thing we had to do was be marched over to the officers' mess so we could have a beer and toast the Queen. <laughs> and then so we went to the, uh, uh, for the mess for the meal and then we briefed, uh, briefed them on what we could provide them. Also went out to uh, 25th Infantry Division at Coochie. Uh, and most of these visits were about a day. Uh, then the follow-on missions were uh, uh, that was for the team. I was selected to go because we were going to so many missions. Uh, I would go uh, into, we were in three corps, uh, would go a little further north and uh, went to uh, um, Anke to the, uh, to the first up there, uh, first air cab and also um, to uh, the rocks and uh, uh, Zwan Lock and a number of other places. Uh, we would take, th those missions would involve uh, getting on a blue canoe aircraft that was, uh, was Cessna the U-3. It was, it was a military version of the uh, Cessna 310. Mm -hmm. We would fly up to the Trang. Uh, there we would, uh, I would go to the base ops, uh, get a hop with the uh, first helicopter squadron that was flying, uh, uh, the Air Force was flying the UH-1Ns, uh, the Hueys. Then from thence we would go out to the unit, they would drop me off uh, and then come back. And it was, uh, 
unusual. I mean, I was a first lieutenant, and here I've got a whole mission to myself. Uh, of course, as we flew along the country, uh, you would see how beautiful the country was, but also the war was only uh, a couple of minutes into the flight where you would be able to see the smoke. You could see um, uh, the airstrikes going on or whatever. Uh, one of the missions uh, we had in the S-3 was to uh, uh, set up a landing zone. So I went in and proofed the zone one day, came back next day, sent out one of my airmen with the classified material. Upon takeoff, uh, the helicopter was hitting the uh, uh, tail rotor, uh, flipped over, crashed. Everybody was doused with avgas, but miraculously, uh, praise God, that the uh, aircraft didn't burn. Oh, everybody survived that. So obviously what had happened is the VC had been using the flight I was on as a, as a uh, dry run, and then when the helicopter came in, mm -hmm. uh, had shot it down. Uh, another mission we had, another way of delivering film, was the Blue Canoe had a uh, tube in the back seat. Uh, not unlike the radio sun drops that the Orion P3s and the helicopter and the hurricane hires have, mm -hmm. where we would uh, get the film, um, have it in a tube with the intelligence report with a little parachute, and we would circle the area, uh, making uh, radio contact or visual contact with the base we were dropping the intel to, and punch it out, and so on and so forth. Um, I also, uh, we also had to cooperate with our, coordinate with our sister unit, the 432nd Reconnaissance Technical Group that was a squadron that was at uh, uh, Udorn Air Force Air, Air Base in Thailand. So I went on a T-39 mission uh, there, uh, coordinated with uh, the operations officer at the time, uh, at the time Captain Tom Mormon, uh, later on Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Uh, Tom was a good friend of ours. Uh, we later worked together at the Air Force Special Projects Production Facility at Westover after I left my tour. Uh, Tom's passed, but he was a great man and a great uh, Air Force officer. Um, in country, what was Vietnam like? Well, the Air Force did a good job on technically training us, but orienting it to you what the culture was. Um, shortly after I got there, I went to one of the local watering holes and was sitting there in a uh, lieutenant from our outfit, uh, Jerome J. Brown, came up to me. Interesting character. He wore a uh, Chicago uh, baseball cap and uh, always was carrying a book around. So I asked him what, what the book was. Well, it was Bernard Falls, uh, Hell in a Very Small Place, that was a false history of the French in involvement into China. So he got me interested in reading that. Um, and so I started understanding more of the, the culture of Vietnam. Uh, the various, uh, uh, the different people, the French uh, presence, uh, World War II when the French came out and so on and so forth. Another time I got an interesting request from the squadron commander uh, who asked me to uh, uh, meet one of the French journalists who was overdoing a story on the Vietnam War. Uh, and he had just come back from Hanoi interviewing General Giap, who was the commander of the uh, the, the armed forces up there. Well, again with approval by the boss and security and so on and so forth, uh, but I met the, the uh, reporter in a uh, little uh, bistro, if you would, in downtown Saigon. At the time, there were still a lot of French restaurants in Saigon, and the owner of the restaurant happened to be a boyhood friend of this reporter. So we chatted about uh, man, of the war and uh, so on and so forth, and uh, just I was limited talking to him about what we were doing, reconnaissance, that is, trying to take the pictures so that we would only hit military targets, mm -hmm. obviously, and, uh, and also to uh, uh, find out where any POWs might be and stuff like that. During the, uh, during the tour, um, uh, we were, the, serious, the only serious mortar attack during my time, there were sporadic ones, was in December. Um, and the next day we were reviewing some of the footage of the security police had, and it turned out one of the BC sa uh, sappers was a barber who had just cut my hair the day, previous day. <laughs> um, but that was in December of 66. Uh, also of note, uh, we had two shows come through. One, uh, of course, Bob Hope, and my dad had seen Bob Hope in World War II. And uh, 
the way we arranged to see it, be, we, had, we would arrange the shifts work so that half the shift would go to the, see the Bob Hope show and, and the other half would come back. But also notice the Reverend Billy Graham was there for mm -hmm. his crusade and he brought that back there with George Beverly Shea and the, and the whole uh, uh, entourage he had and that was a, a very poignant, poignant time. Um, going by land, uh, a number of times we had to uh, uh, go to Benoit uh, to coordinate some uh, activities like bringing down the uh, uh, the film from the, the drones and so mm -hmm. on and so forth and we would get in a jeep and drive up uh, I forget it was Highway 1 or something like that and uh, going up uh, Highway 1 uh, you could see the Army supply trucks and they had reinstituted the name uh, the Red Ball Express from World War II. Um, that quick right digression when my parents uh, were down here visiting before they moved down. Uh, we took my parents to the Army Transportation Museum here at Fort Eustis. Mm -hmm. And one of the exhibits is a diorama with some deuce and a halfs uh, in a winter setting uh, mm -hmm. uh, depicting the Red Bull Express from World War II. And my dad's eyes just started misting up because he had been a supply sergeant during the Battle of the Bulge and uh, uh, was receiving his supplies uh, from uh, the Red Ball Express and so on and so forth. Um, and another time uh, we uh, went, we uh, on an R&R &R trip, well they had MWR, the, they had uh, uh, recreation boats, uh, only, only a lieutenant would do this. Uh, we would get on the boats and they would go up and down the Saigon River. Uh, but that was, uh, but we did go by the Mycon Mon Con restaurant that was the famous or infamous restaurant that had been blown up a couple times mm -hmm. by the VC and so on and so forth. Um, as my tour moved on, uh, there was a move to move some of our capability up, uh, up closer to some of the Army units uh, up, 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 up north of us. So uh, I was picked by the squadron commander to be the uh, project officer uh, to move a segment of the WS-430B that was the Portable Processing and Interpretation Facility, or PPIF, or PIF as we called it. Um, that was a mobile facility that was complete with uh, photo processing trailers, imagery interpretation trailers, administrative trailers, um, maintenance trailer, uh, generators, water bladder, so on and so forth. And uh, we were selected to go up to Phuket Air Base that was up near uh, uh, Quinion. Uh, so, uh, our, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, we had to check out the equipment down, pull the trailers off the docks, get them a tonsanu, get them checked out, load them on any aircraft we could get. So uh, one of the aircraft we moved them up on was a C-124, which was an old prop aircraft that had a was really high off the ground, and we had to winch them up with the excellent load masters we had there, and so on and so forth. So we got them up to up to Phuket, uh, and got them set up, and so we could provide. Uh, more responsive support to the Army uh, that was that was based near there. There was also a ROC uh, division there. Um, we were actually safer there than Saigon because we had that ROC division there to protect us. Right. Some of the other um, vignettes, I guess, would be uh, when we were working the night shift uh, in the photo lab at Tansanut, some of the airmen took a couple extra jobs. Some would go as uh, flare kickers on the C-47s that were doing patrols, but others would get uh, um, a job with the, uh, with the airlines that brought in the uh, Freedom Birds, uh, that brought the troops in and would take them out, and for cleaning out the, uh, uh, the stretched DC-8s from Flying Tiger Airlines. And one of the things that, that they had to get rid of was any excess food, and so one of the treasured items would be the uh, cartons of milk because all we had in Vietnam was the powdered milk or the canned milk. And uh, boy was that a treat. They would bring that in about midnight and then they would, they'd had, we had kind of have a raffle and see who, who, who got the fresh milk and stuff like that. Um, the, more, the movie Good Morning Vietnam wasn't a bad version of, of the movie, although I did meet uh, um, I forget, I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the, the actual DJ uh, right. at a meeting down here. And he, he told me that some of the things that were really good. 
But the DJ at the time was a our airman called Kramer Haas, and yes, indeed, you wait, did wake up in the morning with "Good Morning Vietnam" and so on and so forth. And that was a kind of a morale booster, and so on and so forth. Um, let me just check here with a couple notes. Um, also. Um, one of the things I grew to hate were the, some of the treats we had or, or to eat were beanie weenies, the little tin big cans of beans, and I grew to hate them just as I grew to hate uh, uh, burritos when I was in Korea because we, that was one of the few things we could actually you know, microwave in the bunkers and stuff like that. And as my dad hated Spam when he, from World War II, he would never, uh, my dad would never touch Spam, nor also would he listen to uh, White Christmas by Bing Crosby. Because during the Battle of the Bulls, the, the Germans were played across the war to, uh, uh, to demoralize mm -hmm. the Americans, so on and so forth. As my tour came to an end, uh, uh, I got orders for uh, Westover Air Force Base. And uh, it's, Westover was a SAC base. They had the B-52s and KC-135s mm -hmm. there and so on and so forth. And, um, my order said Air Force Systems Command. Well, it was a SAC base. It's a special project facility. And I asked one of my sergeants, what do I do there? He said, I can't tell you, Lieutenant. And that's, a, that's kind of another story. Um, life in Saigon was, uh, was very busy uh, with the motorcycles and the Citroëns and everything zooming around, the uh, QC, uh, the Vietnamese uh, police and so on and so forth. We call them the white mice and stuff like that. Um, some of the places downtown we would go, uh, Circle Sportif, uh, there was an excellent restaurant and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, the food in Saigon off base was not bad, uh, the, even the street food. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we would go to the top of the Brinks or Rex Hotel, there were two of the GI hotels, and uh, you could sit up there and uh, you kind of, of uh, set apart from the war except for you could look out and you could see the, the spookies out there with their gunships or sometimes you see the arc lights uh, going on and so on and so forth out there. Um, I only got food poisoning twice in Vietnam, once from the Tan Sinu Club and once from the uh, uh, Club at Phuket. Mm -hmm. Good people, good memories. Uh, one time uh, I was uh, just reading the traffic as we did to, to see, check on the missions that were coming in and so on and so forth. And uh, one of my classmates, uh, uh, Captain Glenn Myers, was shot down. He was a backseater in an F-4, RF-4C. Um, all we knew was he was captured. Then after uh, uh, my tour at Westover, I was stationed at the Pentagon. and. Uh, was involved with uh, monitoring the Vietnam War and involved in a lot of operations that involved the Vietnam War there, the uh, uh, getting, new, again, better cameras, better techniques, and so on and so forth. But uh, as Operation Homecoming was coming up, I uh, found out that Glenn was coming home with a number of the other POWs that had been released. So my wife and I were uh, really honored and, and praise God we could meet him when he came back and, and shared some time with him and so on yeah. and so forth. Um, like I mentioned, the Hel Helena, a very small place with, uh, with Bernard Fall was, uh, uh, was an excellent book. Uh, uh, Recollections of a Tack Recce Pilot um, by, uh, I'll get his name in a minute, um, was uh, a very good book on the, uh, on the life in Saigon. Um, General McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, um, that covers the Vietnam War from, oh, I think around 64 to about the 67, 68 time frame, both the in-country uh, uh, intrigues with the ambassadors and, mm -hmm. the, and the agencies and so on and so forth, um, along with the, the, all the political intrigues, so on and so forth, in, in the Pentagon, is an excellent read. Um, having both been in Saigon and been at the Pentagon, seeing the, the various uh, political and military decisions that were made and so on and so forth. That is, a, that is really a must read uh, for, for anybody to, to, to look at. Um, an excellent uh, uh, 
video that's available on YouTube is Unarmed, Alone, and Unafraid. Uh, that was an Air Force documentary on tactical reconnaissance in Southeast Asia. Also, uh, Ellen Borkman um, had an article in Aviation History magazine. Uh, on the RF-4s in Vietnam, and uh, that is a, an excellent article on, uh, on the war and uh, warfare without weapons. Mm -hmm. So in summary, my Vietnam experience was hard to believe it's been that long. It was uh, met fantastic people, uh, people doing their jobs, um, but um, we lost a lot of friends. Um, every day, our, the, our unit was stationed uh, right across the helicopter pad from the Third Field Hospital, and you can see the helicopters coming in day by day. On the road to, on the, as we walked to the uh, to the post office, we walked by the morgue, and. Uh, when an operation was starting, you could see the uh, you could see the uh, additional um, uh, caskets coming in. Uh, I don't know if I really want that in, but just for the record, uh, uh, so the war was always there. Yeah. Um, I was privileged being in the Air Force when I came back. I was still on active duty. Uh, I met my wife now, coming up on 55 years. Uh, Linda Westover Air Force Base. Uh, those of us who stayed on active duty had a lot easier time uh, adjusting, because yeah. uh, we were on, we were with other Air Force men and women um, uh, to share our experiences and, and, and keep working mm -hmm. kind of the same environment. Of course, at Westover Air Force Base, uh, the 99th Bomb Wing uh, had the had the B-52s that were deploying over an arc light and the KC-135s going on Young Tiger missions. So that base had a constant supply mm -hmm. uh, a constant flow of people to and from there and we were we could share experiences but the uh, the guys I knew that were in for the, that were drafted or enlisted uh, 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 on their own uh, when they came back after the two years it was yeah, wham bam thank you ma'am and you're out and uh, you know anytime you're overseas for a long period of time if you just take a quick trip overseas it doesn't you don't get the experience but uh, um, so many things have changed, and you know. So, it, uh, like I say, being an Air Force family, uh, military family, was a lot easier. But um, um, of course, we didn't call PTSD or anything like that. But uh, uh, but we did uh, try to take out care of each other, you know, yeah. a, a, as much as as much as we can, and uh, hope projects like this keep it alive and people. Uh, Realize the uh, and that the sacrifice is not just of the men and women who went over, but their families. Uh, uh, I have one re the, the tour in Vietnam that had a remote tour in Korea, and in '83, '84 we didn't have uh, emails and cell phones and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You could maybe make a Mars call once in a while. Uh, uh, sometimes after chapel at Osan, I'd, I'd call the family at Griffiths and stuff like that. But you rely on letters and stuff like that. But the families and, and, and friends that keep together, that, that's really important. And of course the chapels and what the chaplains did and, uh, and everything else like that. So uh, the support that the, the people give our veterans uh, is really important. Uh, so anyway, uh, welcome home brothers <laughs> and sisters. And uh, we'll never forget. Thank you. Let me back up a little bit and talk about the people of Vietnam. How did how were you guys received? Mo mo mostly, I'm sure there were some outliers here and there. But well, living on the economy, um, we had a maid. Uh, her name was High, I believe, and uh, the people in our neighborhood uh, were, were friendly. Uh, we uh, would say hello. Um, uh, when you would go out to uh, wait for the bus or something like that or something on the streets, uh, uh, there was always a threat of, uh, of a terrorist throwing a bomb. There was a, uh, um, 
at the time there was a, uh, uh, a female terrorist who was, was running around on a, on a motorcycle and stuff like that. Uh, I forget the nickname they had for her. But uh, you, did, you just got used to that. But the people overall, um, one time um, some friends of ours, uh, some of my uh, squadron mates, we went to the Saigon Zoo. And as soon as we were at the zoo, the kids all came up to us, wanted to talk and wanted mm -hmm. so and so forth, and, and we had a good time. Um, there was a racetrack outside of Tansu Air Base. We went there once or twice just to watch the race. It's fun for something to do. And the people were, again, very friendly. Of course, that racetrack was later used by the VC during their uh, the Tet Offensive uh, mm -hmm. in 68 after we left. Um, worked uh, with the Vietnamese uh, Air Force. Uh, they had their own... Um, Reconnaissance capability, I believe it was an RC-47. It was a C-47 with some cameras, and they would come by. So um, um, what, what struck you, though, even though I'd grown up outside of New York City and, uh, and North Jersey and so on and so forth, but um, I, I guess was the uh, discrepancy. Uh, you see that in a lot of the um, mm. Third world's kind of an overused term, but but an evolving country. Mm -hmm. um, um, you could see the glory of the uh, of, of the French that were there, uh, the buildings and, and restaurants. But you could also see the glory of the uh, Vietnamese architecture, their their temples and so on and so forth. Uh, it was a very pretty city, uh, but but overall the people we saw no really open hostility. Again, we were initial build up, you know, 66, 67, um, and Tet of 60. Seven, not the one we were attacked, but um, but I went out and uh, walked around and took some movies and pictures uh, during the celebrations with the dragons and mm -hmm. the firecrackers and so on and so forth. And uh, um, uh, they were very dedicated people. Um, one of the pictures I gave you was, uh, as as most uh, or almost all uh, units do, uh, we adopted an orphanage. Um, this was not in Vietnam, but you know, throughout, you know, uh, whenever troops are around right. communities and stuff like that, they find a need. So uh, we collected money and uh, enough money to give the nuns uh, money to buy a pedal a sewing machine. And boy, you, you, you thought that we uh, could have given them a million bucks because they were, they were sewing for right. them. So um, overall, it was, uh, and like I said, the even the street food. Uh, <coughs> uh, they have soup, they have French bread, uh, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it was a positive experience with, with the Vietnamese people. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I went out to the field, and, and, and I forget exactly what unit I visited, but we're, we're, we were treated you know, as equals, and they treated us as equals, and there were, I didn't see any, uh, you know, they were uh, our counterparts. Right, right. You were there for Operation Linebacker? Yes. Can you describe what that is, and how did that affect what you guys were doing? Well. Linebacker was the offense of our op operations against uh, uh, North Vietnam and to, and to stop the flow of, uh, of uh, uh, supplies mm -hmm. coming down from the north through the Ho Chi Minh Trail and other areas. Um, the tactical reconnaissance aircraft were often tasked with, uh, uh, there were various missions, area search, lines, uh, point point targets, uh, lines of communication search, or LOCs. And so they would try to fly where we thought the, uh, where the supplies were coming in and uh, be able to select targets. Um, uh, also, uh, in addition to our aircraft, uh, the uh, uh, gunships uh, that were not flown out of our area, but uh, would, would go up and uh, uh, with their infrared cameras were able to look at night and, and find the thing. But uh, we would, uh, the targets that we were tasked for, the tasking would come down from Washington to, to, to Sink Pack uh, to uh, uh, 7th Air Force uh, for the targets we were supposed to take the photographs of. Uh, that was a 460th attack reconnaissance wing. Uh, that was the, was the wing that had the aircraft, and like I said, we were subservient to them doing mm -hmm. the processing and exportation. So uh, our photo interpreters were charged with uh, selecting, with uh, reading out the film and, and getting the reports back. Now, um, how do we get the reports back? Well, there was couriers, the Arf Coast Couriers, Armed Forces Courier Service, 
while I was there, uh, uh, we had an interesting project that I was made projects officer for to integrate. It was called uh, Compass Link. And again, this is in the summer of 1967. Um, we had a satellite terminal, and again, 67 now, this is pretty basic technology, but CBS Labs was a contractor. And uh, we would be told what targets to select, and then we would cut out about a five by five inch uh, transparency mm -hmm. from the film, or the duplicate of the film, and it would be put on a machine by, made by uh, uh, CBS Labs, and it would scan it, kind of like you see in the old uh, movies, right. you know, doing the t newspapers and so on and so forth. Uh, the, Im the imagery or data at the time would be bounced from Saigon uh, up to a satellite into Hickam and then Hickam into Washington. And then it would be uh, pro processed there by the DIA at, uh, on Fern Street, uh, uh, DIDC 6 I think it was, uh, and then it would be passed out. So we, we supported the uh, operational linebacker that way. Uh, but then, like I said, once the SR-71 started flying and they had U-2s, uh, they would provide imagery for them also. At the time, the satellites were primarily targeted against uh, Russia and so on and so forth. At the time we had 66, the only operational satellite we had was the KH-4 Corona. And, uh, that would go around the earth and, and they take the pictures and then normally up for about two to three weeks at a time and then it would take the imagery, uh, put it in a, in a capsule that was on the satellite, it would, it would, it would uh, pop down to uh, over Hawaii and then a, and a modified C-119 or C-130 would snatch the film and would take it to Hickam and then to back to the States, either to Eastman Kodak Company and that was declassified in, 19, in 2015, or at our facility mm. that I was went to afterwards, the Air Force Special Project Production Facility, Westover Air Force Base for processing and duplication. So for tactical purposes, uh, it wasn't appropriate right. for retargeting and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, uh, but like I said, but there were uh, linebacker strikes around Saigon and you could actually feel them and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and then, like I say, I knew a lot of the crews up at Westover uh, that, uh, that flew the linebacker missions and also tanker crews that flew the young Tigers that were refueling for them. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, that's linebacker. I, I was in Rolling Thunder. Okay. Um, linebacker was uh, 72, 73 time, I, I, okay. right around the, you know, um, Rolling Thunder were the operations when I was there. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, well, is there a, a, a memory that you have about Vietnam that stands out the most? Something you you know that you always go back to. Um. I guess I've been to so many interesting areas that it, it's one it's it's one of the prime areas, and. Uh, in um, doing projects like that, it brings back a lot of people and memories and so on and so forth. Right. Um, of course, the loss of my classmates and, uh, and people and stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, is, is always with you. Yeah. So from there, and you've, you've mentioned it a few times, you went to Westover Air Force Base yes. and uh, the Special Projects Unit. Yes. Can you touch on that briefly, what, yes. you, what you can say? Yes, um, I got the orders for uh, Westover Air Force Base, Air Force Special Projects Production Facility. Now, uh, and that had that was pretty much declassified by 2015. The Air Force Special Projects Production Facility was established in 1961 uh, uh, to process film from and duplicate film from nationally tasked aircraft and satellites, the U-2s uh, at the time and the Corona satellite, the KH-4 Corona, mm -hmm. it was the first mass-produced mass uh, operational satellite. Um, the, uh, the unit had actually three different missions. So one was to, to process the film and to make duplicates of it. Um, we processed, the duplicates we made were made for all U.S. customers. In other words, if you were in a, if you were in any of the 
armed services or departments or agencies, uh, the film you got came from us, from, from Westover. We had a, a, a large clean room facility. All the film had to be processed using bunny suits. Um, because of the, the scale of the film at the time, uh, was that, you know, initially even a, a piece of dust or hair could, could obscure an aircraft. Mm -hmm. As the satellites got better and the scale got bigger, um, um, but we still maintained that clean room facility. Each mission uh, could be like 20,000 feet of film. We'd have to process that and duplicate it 25 times or so. Mm -hmm. And each foot of film was inspected by a precision technician. My job at the AFSPPF for four years was uh, chief of quality control, and we were responsible for uh, reviewing every foot of film went out, not only for physical defects, but also photographic quality to make sure if you looked at the film at Offutt Air Force Base or Wiesbaden, in Germany or uh, uh, Stuttgart, Germany, the film was the same. So when you were yeah. talking to another analyst by secure phone or by message, you know what you were seeing. Um, the, uh, the next uh, uh, mission of the facility was evaluation. After each mission, a team uh, would come from uh, the CIA, contractors, the Air Force, and so on and so forth to meet at the facility. Uh, and in the evaluation division uh, would analyze the film uh, for quality. Now, how do we do that? Um, we would, uh, uh, they would be able to look at objects in the ground. Mm -hmm. Can you identify a truck from a car? Right. But also we had what we call corn targets, cor controlled range network that when the, when, the, when the satellite was going around and it would come around a pass, what we called over the U.S., uh, we from Westover would dispatch a team to go out and uh, at the time the contractor, I think with Data Corporation from uh, Xenia, Ohio, would go out and lay out panels, resolution targets, uh, black and white splotches, et cetera. Okay. The satellite would film them. And then they would analyze the imagery with, with photo interpreters, photo engineers, and also um, uh, microdensitometers and so on and so forth to come up with various uh, measures of resolution, uh, lines, per, lines per inch, uh, modulation transfer functions, so on and so forth. Uh, the third function was research and development. We were, ta we were tasked with evaluating various uh, uh, photographic processes uh, to process the original film and to make, and to make uh, select prints afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, we also had uh, uh, missions where we cooperated with NASA on the noon f moon photography, where we would be brought copies of the negative film that the astronauts had taken on the moon and looking with the, with the, with the new processes we were looking at, could we enhance the moon photography? Um, uh, the facility was uh, assigned to Air Force Systems Command, but under the administrative uh, control of the uh, uh, National Reconnaissance Office of the CIA, uh, uh, SP-10 on the West Coast, the Office of uh, Space Systems. Um, we wore Air Force uniforms, fatigues and so on and so forth, blue, blue uniforms. Uh, our Performance reports couldn't say anything what we did, but uh, they had ways to let the board know that uh, what we were doing uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, there is a book out, um, Our Secret, uh, Our Mission Revealed by Lloyd Spanberger mm -hmm. that was uh, published uh, commercially uh, that's available through Xenia Press that uh, describes our unit. Also, if you go to the National Reconnaissance Office website, uh, and look at under uh, Na Air Force Special Projects f Production Facility. Uh, that uh, will give you a uh, uh, the formal redacted history. Over the history uh, of, of, of the facility process, millions and millions of feet of film. Uh, one interesting vignette, uh, when we, when we were married at the Worcester Chapel. Uh, uh, the squadron commander there, uh, Colonel Ralph Swofford, who I had worked with that in, in Saigon, mm -hmm. and he later took me to the Pentagon, uh, said to, to my wife, uh, welcome to the Air Force. Your husband's going TDY Monday <laughs> uh, to Beale Air Force Base. So Tech Sergeant Leroy Coulter and I packed our bags after uh, my wife and I had a brief honeymoon and went out to uh, work with the SR-71 on uh, 
providing with some new techniques to enhance the processing of the uh, uh, of the SR-71, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Loomis Robertson and the guys out there who we worked with. Uh, we also uh, processed the uh, U-2 photography there. Uh, we were the backup laboratory to the Naval Reconnaissance Technical Support Center at Suitland, Maryland. Um, uh, well, they were had getting some processors uh, upgraded. Uh, we had some missions uh, come into Westover. Uh, Westover had been involved in the in the Cuban Bristol Crisis, processing film as was Kodak, uh, and of course the U-2s. Uh, um, Thirteen Days is an excellent movie. Uh, uh, if you want to see that about the thing, it does cover uh, to a certain extent uh, the role the Navy played with their uh, uh, RF-8 Crusaders. Uh, Major Anderson, who lost his life in the U-2 over there, um, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, just interesting people um, uh, that I met there. Uh, later on in my career, uh, speaking of photo reconnaissance, uh, when I was at my final tour at Langley Air Force Base, um, I went to a uh, reception at the Smithsonian. Uh, the American site for photogrammetry and remote sensing had a, they were doing a reprint of Constance Babington Smith's uh, book Air Spy. Uh, Constance Babington Smith was the photo interpreter from World War II who uh, discovered the V1 sites. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, she uh, excellent book, anybody interested in history, photo reconnaissance, and so on and so forth. And so I was talking to her and asked her, uh, uh, well, how, how did you know what to look for? I mean, you knew these rumors of German secret weapons, and you're looking at photography, mm -hmm. what would you know to look for? Or the signature, as we talk about in the intelligence community. Well, she said that she had been talking with Sir Frank Whittle, who was the British uh, scientist who had uh, uh, was the pioneer for the British uh, turbojets, as uh, you know, Jun uh, Junkers was in Germany, and uh, um, Bell was uh, Bell Air, you know, the P-69 in, in uh, the U.S. We said, well, I asked Sir Frank Whittle what might uh, a missile look like, and he kind of talked about it. She says, well, and he's sitting right over there, and here's this gentleman just sitting in a chair. Of course, everybody's th all the scientists and officers and everything are talking to uh, uh, Constance Babington Smith. So I said, do you think I could talk to him? So I had the honor of going over to and talking, spending about five or ten minutes with Sir Frank Whittle, just talking about tech, you know, yeah. how, why he was different than, you know, right. Junkers or Caproni right. with, his, uh, with his compression engine in, in, in Italy at the time and so on and so forth. But, uh, uh, With the National Military Intelligence Association, later on, I was at a banquet in Washington, D.C., and it was uh, uh, to give out honors to the intelligence people mm -hmm. in the community. And uh, there was a gentleman standing at the bar, and I knew we were going to have Tom Clancy as a speaker, so I went up and said, are you Tom Clancy? He said, yes, I am. And I just, of course, finished his first book. Uh, you know, and I said, well, how did you really find you know, come up with that stuff. He said, well, I went to open sources. His background, as you may or may not know, was a realtor. Hmm. And uh, he said, uh, well, yeah, I did a lot of open source work. And I said, well, of course, you had to go through the clearances. He said, the government people came to me and says, we can figure out everything you came up with except three. He said, what were they? He said, we can't tell you. Publish the book. <laughs> so, uh, but... Um, I guess one final note, uh, uh, you know, people would ask me, especially with my, what I did with the uh, satellites and so on and so forth, um, you know, you didn't talk about it? No. Why not? Well, I, I, I had an oath and I signed yeah. it and I, I kept it, you know. Uh, uh, famous quote, duty is a blindless word in the English language. I mean, it's, you know, your word is your word. And well, didn't your wife ever ask you no? I said, well, let me put it to you this way. If you were an accountant, would you go blabbing about Mr. Smith's having bankruptcy problems? Or if you were a doctor, would you talk about uh, uh, Mr. Brown has a certain medical problem? I said it's a professional courtesy, but it's also, you know, you, you have an oath to, to mm -hmm. maintain people's honor and secrecy. So um, 
as uh, details of various missions and so on and so forth came out, both Vietnam uh, and Cold War and, and on, um, you know, we talk about them after, you know, approval comes and you have a, a approval from the various agencies. Uh, so, and I give all our men and women credit because, uh, uh, especially the men and women that worked at the uh, special project facility, they couldn't tell their children and their grandchildren, even their spouses, until, uh, uh, well, the first was 2002 when we got, I got an initial letter from the director of the NRO that we could talk about certain things, and then we got fur further letters. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, we live in a great country, and people, you know, honor the, those yeah. that have gone before and honor the secrets we've been given yeah. with, and we, you know, s hope to keep that up. Yeah. Let me talk briefly real quick before we, we wrap this up. Uh, you're talking about the secrets. Mm -hmm. From someone on the outside looking in, it, it sounds like all you guys did was process film and analyze it. Mm -hmm. why, why so much secrecy doing that? It seems kind of benign, right? All we do is look at film and... Well, the mission, okay, the, in, in Vietnam War, the aircraft weren't classified, but certain mm -hmm. sensors were classified right. because they had certain capabilities. If the enemy knows, we can, we can find you under a tree canopy. Right. If we can see evidence you leave behind. In other words, infrared film or, or a heat sensor. We take a look at, a, at, a, at, a, at an aircraft field, say. Nobody's there. We can take an infrared sensor, if the time is right, and we can see a shadow on the ground that's a heat shadow, or a, or a shadow that from the sunlight and there's a shadow of the airplane. So we can see that an aircraft wasn't there. Yeah. Um, if they have dummy aircraft out there, and I have a radar sensor, dummies look like real aircraft, whether made of wood or, or balloons like yeah. World War II, but with a certain sensor you can tell it, it's fake. Right. Uh, the missions, if we're targeting a certain area, uh, like during the Vietnam War, before we, uh, Rolling Thunder started hitting like Kep and Wallach, the, the North Vietnamese airfields, uh, we really didn't want to let them know that we were targeting their airfields. So while the aircraft wasn't classified, but the mission was, okay. if we're going from here to there, uh, because if details of the mission get out, then they can intercept the aircraft, yeah. and, and that puts our air crews at risk. Um, as we're reading out the film, if the target's successful or unsuccessful, that means we don't fly or we do fly again, and that's information an enemy could, yeah. could, use, uh, could, could use. But like I say, but there are some techniques that were classified, there were some capabilities that were classified. Um, Another example, with satellites, when the, um, a certain satellite's looking at the ground, it can be considered classified because you're targeting enemy. Mm -hmm. If you turn the same thing and look at the stars, it could be unclassified because you're looking out there. So it's, uh, um, your decisions are made by people in the know that knowing certain capabilities, yeah. you know, uh, would be detrimental to the security of the country. Yeah. yeah. How do you think that your experiences in the military, specifically uh, your wartime experiences, mm -hmm. how how do you how does that shape who you became? Well, I guess it reinforced what I learned at the Citadel about, you know, honor. Uh, to quote General Guard, duty honor country. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, that it follow through. Um, when you see the sacrifices that men and women make, um, both in the military and industry, uh, uh, the impact you have with, uh, uh, like, orphanages and, th and things like that, um, and, and that follows through, uh, um, and the fact that you can take skills you have from, that you learned in, in, in combat, or in a combat zone, and, and, and use them in your civilian life. Again, uh, you know, can you trust somebody? Uh, you go to an automobile dealer and he gives you a shoddy work, 
uh, or, 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 or try to have you make an extra repair you don't have. But, uh, you know, you want to make sure when that airplane launches that everything is done right. And same yeah. thing, you know. So I think a lot of it's integrity, that it, 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 it reinforce that. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, I think your faith in God and stuff like that. Uh, the fact that uh, he looks over us and cares for us. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but like I say, the, uh, uh, when I was working with the, uh, volunteering with the city of Newport News, uh, the skills I picked up in Vietnam, dealing with maps and imagery, um, helped to help cat uh, catalog a lot of their imagery they had. They had some of the old maps and uh, uh, from uh, going back to John Smith to the Civil War and how you can tie, tie, tie them together in a picture. Um, uh, when Dr. Kelso was starting the Jamestown Rediscovery Project, uh, another uh, scientist and myself from the firm I worked with, uh, Autometric, when I got out of the service, went up there and gave them some ideas on how we could tie together stuff in a, uh, at the time it was emerging technology, but geographic information systems yeah. to, to try to see, uh, you know, those techniques. So a lot of uh, uh, the technology that came out of the war uh, has been used for good. Yeah. Yeah. What would you like some, someone who might see this to know most about your service? Well, I was blessed and privileged to serve with the people I did, uh, with the, with the, uh, um, with the leadership uh, training they got in the Civil Air Patrol and with, at the Citadel uh, under General Mark W. Clark, um, with the people like Colonel Swoford, uh, that uh, was my boss and mentored me through three assignments. Um, At the time, uh, Tech Sergeant Moose Miller, uh, uh, Senior Mess Sergeant Charlie Jenkins, uh, uh, the men, uh, NCOs and officers I worked with, uh, civilians I worked with in my career, uh, I was very honored. And uh, uh, I think it was, uh, it was unique for me in history, but uh, the lessons you learned, I think you'll never forget, and you never forget the people you work with. Yeah. Well, sir, on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Experience, thank you very much well, thank for you. taking some time out of your day to share your story. Okay. Uh, and most importantly, thank you for your service. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and welcome home.